Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here. It's wonderful after uh, four years of incredibly hard toil to actually be on the other side and be able to um, share with you the product of, of so many people's hard work, which was largely built on a foundation that Rosina uh, personally helped to build. Um, I was part of the first national climate assessment process, and, and Rosina actually um, set that whole process in motion from the beginning. So uh, we, the country owes a lot to the University of Michigan now and to Rosina then uh, for where we are today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the water chapter. Uh, I was the lead author for the water chapter in the first national climate assessment. I actually was not an author of the chapter in this case because I was busily hurting the, all of the cats simultaneously. But uh, what I do want to do is emphasize a little bit more than what you've heard already today about the interdisciplinary and intersectoral nature of the work that we did in this assessment. And one of the main reasons we did that is uh, our collective perception that risk is actually not something that occurs within stovepipes. It's actually caused by the intersection of systems, and it has a lot to do with underlying uh, underlying vulnerabilities as well as the new uh, risks that are associated with climate change or the new stresses that come from, from climate change. Uh, we did choose to focus on a risk-based framing because we thought that would be most useful from a decision perspective, um, but we also wanted to start ingraining in decision makers' activities an expectation of using scientific information and, and help in how to do that. So part of our thought process from the beginning was doing an assessment that was truly useful in a decision context. I'll hit first a couple of the report findings that relate to water, although we would be hard pressed to find a report finding that didn't relate to water. Uh, water is actually the universal solvent, as they say, uh, but it also is a universal phenomenon relative to climate change because it's both a driver of change and a way that we experience change in terms of water resources management and the day-to-day the -day, uh, availability of water resources for the environment and for human activities and so forth. But a, a main message from this assessment is that extreme events will have a lot to do with the way we experience climate change and much of the infrastructure that's already been damaged and is expected to be damaged in the future is either damaged by water or is infrastructure to deliver water. So um, there's a lot of connection here, whether it's um, salt water or fresh water uh, with impacts that people are feeling. Uh, in addition, uh, besides just these kinds of extreme events that involve excess amounts of water, we're also defining extreme events in terms of drought and long-term uh, problems with water supply availability. And part of that comes from the fact that temperature is essentially a hydrologic variable. When you have higher temperatures, you by definition lose more water to the atmosphere, plants need more water, soil moisture goes down, runoff in rivers is reduced, and demand is simultaneously increased. So the conclusions of, of the water chapter, which actually sort of pervade this document, are that water quality and water supply reliability are jeopardized but it's both by flooding and by drought. And this is something that is hard for people to understand, but you heard Rosina explain it. We actually are uh, already seeing changes in terms of the amount of water coming in heavy downpours, even in places that are getting drier and vice versa. So the, the water chapter actually um, is one of the longer ones, uh, and it's because of this complicated relationship between water and virtually everything else. But they focused on both fluxes in the water system, sort of changes in flows, and changes in storage in groundwater and in surface water, which I was very happy to see them working on groundwater, which has really been ignored um, in previous assessments, mostly because we didn't have much information. They also looked at vulnerabilities and on management adaptation and institutional responses. Um, we did try in all of the teams that we set up to get practitioners and scientists talking together as part of the assessment process so that we understood what was important to those decision makers um, 
and the scientists, and they could actually be part of a relationship in an ongoing learning process. Uh, though water quality has always been mentioned as an impact of climate assessment, uh, or sorry, of climate impacts, we really have not seen as much documentation in the scientific literature as I think is still needed. But the factors uh, are starting to be much better understood. Um, water temperature, um, increases in sediment and uh, all kinds of pollution that come from extreme events. Marie mentioned all of this. Uh, it is clear that in terms of adapting to these changes, strategies that aim to reduce sediment, uh, nutrient, and contaminant loads are very helpful. But for example, in managing water supplies in the West, storing water when you're in a flooding situation uh, in order to have access in the future, for example, through groundwater recharge, is another good adaptation option. You saw uh, this, this particular graphic. To me, it's one, it's one of the most important graphics in the assessment. This idea that we could have had, or we actually have had, a 71% increase in the volume of water that's coming in intense precipitation in the Northeast is really quite amazing. Uh, this is an astounding figure, and I think um, though it's not as dramatic in other parts of the country, it is in fact uh, something that planners and engineers and water managers all need to be paying attention to. But we don't want to talk just about the water sector itself. We want to look at the implications for broad sectors, including energy and water and how land use decisions are made and how the intersections of these systems are actually affected by climate change itself. Climate change is affecting not only vulnerability, but also the options that we have in order to respond. And it's very important for people to see these things as integrated problems, because if they don't, they actually may make maladaptive decisions. They may actually move us closer to the brink rather than farther from the brink. And we need to understand a lot of underlying changes because they do affect regions very differently. So for example, higher summer temperatures are increasing electricity use. Uh, it turns out that cooling demand is met by a different source of energy than heating demand. And as we change the temperatures across the country, we're actually changing the seasonal demand for electricity rather dramatically. And it's, it's very obvious in this graphic here um, that you can actually see the cooling demand is increasing and the heating demand is decreasing across the entire country. But the story regionally is actually much more subtle. It has all kinds of implications for the relationships between water and energy and which renewable sources of supply we might pick into going into the future. So changes in water availability, both in terms of short-term phenomena and long-term trends, really constrain already energy production. We've got evidence of that, um, you know, nuclear power plants that have been had to be shut down only because water temperatures were getting so high they couldn't meet regulatory requirements to discharge. Or in many other cases, the ability to, to generate electricity at all has been constrained by drought and so forth. So all of these changes affect which, which types of power we, we pick for the future as we're trying to manage our emissions and adapt and limit risk. One of the more important contributions of the water chapter in this assessment actually has to do with very subtle distinctions made in different kinds of flooding. So there's been a lot of debate. In fact, we've got lots of comments about the, the conclusions having to do with flooding. It's not a simple equation. So flash and urban flooding, the kinds that are most associated with, with downpours, are expected to increase. But because rivers have watersheds, in some cases, that are extremely large uh, and or there are antecedent conditions, you know, dry soils or wet soils that really affect flooding, you can't always say that all rivers are going to flood more because of more intensity in precipitation. But we can say with some confidence that coastal flooding is expected to increase. So you can see that making a generic statement about flooding is not as helpful as helping people to understand sort of the sources of these flooding uh, conclusions. Anyway, that's the extent of, of my uh, presentation, but I'm more than happy to take questions afterwards. As you heard from, uh, from Emily and from Rosina, this has been an enormous effort, and we are 
very strongly hoping <laughs> that all of the capacity that we have built across the country uh, will result in a sustained process where we can continue to add to the knowledge base and have people who are already trained and understand vulnerability assessment and documenting these things are able to help pull together information much more easily for our, for our next assessment than what we've just been through. Because frankly, we had to build the entire machine and then we had to run the machine to get where we are today. And if we actually were more in an ongoing assessment mode, it would be far more rigorous and useful and um, a whole lot less work. Anyway, thank you so much for having me here um, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, and the role of the region's forests as a net absorber uh, of carbon is potentially, potentially at risk or no longer be such a strong absorber. Uh, this is a